Welcome back to another UNC Tar Heels football podcast here on TarHeelIllustrated.com. And if you are watching us on our fast-growing YouTube channel, that is called Tar Heel Illustrated. I'm THI publisher Andrew Jones. And joining me is THI staff writer, photographer, videographer, uh, transcriber, uh, long road trip companion, Mr. Brandon P. This Personal. is the yes, this is the <laughs> bye week edition of our podcast. Basically, what we're doing at the Tar Heels in a bye week. You and I are doing two podcasts. One, we're gonna look at the first three games and, and grind out thoughts about the offense. And in another podcast, we're gonna do the same thing about the defense. So Brandon, the Tar Heels are averaging 51.3 points a game versus 37.7 that they're giving up. Of course, we're, we're going to juxtapose some things, but mainly focus on offense here. Uh, they have been quite prolific for the most part, yeah. obviously. I don't think that that's news to anybody. Stubbed their toes a little bit in Atlanta. You were on the field shooting for us in Atlanta. You were in the press box for the first two games. So when you think about where this offense is now, as the final second ticked off the clock at Center Park Stadium, uh, first three games in, where is the offense to you? In my opinion, I think this offense is very prolific. Matter of fact, I think it's the most prolific offense that Mac Brown has ever assembled in Chapel Hill. With them averaging over 50 points without their best two receivers, I think that's a very positive sign for this offense. I think uh, I think a guy like Drake May is doing a very good job of spreading the ball around, making sure he gets everybody involved. He keeps the defense guessing. He doesn't make one guy the focal point of the offense, and I think that's the, one of the that's one of the main strengths that this team that this offense has that uh, offenses of Mac Brown in the past didn't have. I think uh, he, there's a lot of guys that are stepping up. The tight end room has stepped up. They they have they already have they are they uh, they've already matched almost matched their season total in yards and touchdowns from a year ago. Yeah, 383 yards combined last year. They have 359 this year already through the first three games. So I think, and I think it all boils down to a guy like Drake May just you know spreading the ball around. You know not really locking on to one guy, just going through his progressions and always constantly making the right decision. And I think with a guy like that, he'll always, this all, I think with Drake may healthy, this, this offense will always be prolific. Yeah. We'll get into Drake in a bit. I think the spreading the wealth is really to me, what jumps out about the offense in the first three games, seven. I did a piece last week where uh, it was about spreading the wealth. And this was before the Georgia state game that already seven different receivers had caught touchdown passes and 10 different players had scored touchdowns. In 2020, which was the most prolific, prolific offense Mac Brown has had at North Carolina, either first or second stint, that club averaged, what, 41 points a game, <clears throat> just about 41 points a game. Yeah. They didn't have their, t their seventh guy didn't catch a touchdown pass until the fifth game, and that was Josh Downs, and that was oh. against NC State. That, and that was also when Sam Howell threw his uh, ninth touchdown pass of the season. And Drake May surpassed that, had that through the first two games. So they are spreading the wealth a lot more than what we've seen, which is interesting because Josh Downs and somewhat Antoine Green were the only returning guys that had done anything in the receiver room. Uh, Antoine hasn't played yet. Josh went down late in the Florida A&M game and hasn't played since. So it's forced other guys to step up. But I think what's very encouraging about Carolina is each of those other guys has had their wow stretches. J.J. Jones has had his wow stretch. Gavin Blackwell, maybe not as much of a stretch, but periodically he's made some wow plays. And Kobe Pesor has had a couple of very, a very a big time wow stretches as well. He was awesome. <clears throat> at App State. So, and then you talk about the tight ends. They have three that can catch the ball. They can run any route. They can catch the ball and they can turn their nose up field and run. Kamari Morales has shown us many times in his career that when he catches the ball, if he can shake a DB, he's going to the end zone. He did that again yeah. Saturday in Atlanta. And the thing I like about Bryson Nesbitt that we weren't sure about yet because we knew he could be explosive. He has proven to be a chain moving first down. So he combines the element of boom, he can take off, get by guys, but 
when he's running, when he's when he's running a route to get the first down, it opens up all kinds of stuff because defenses have to be uber aware of everybody. And I think that's part of it. I think each of them makes the others better because they're all very difficult to defend. You can't trick your secondary when you scheme for North Carolina. You just have to try to win battles. And for a guy like Drake, who sees everything, it's probably a little bit like a video game back there. You know, okay, well, which guy am I going to now? Because someone is almost always open. In fact, most of his incomplete passes, there's only been a couple of bad throws, if you will. Most have been right there to a guy uh, within range to make a play. They look they look video game-like a lot of offense when they pass uh, because of all those options. I think it's big to me that it's been something that has exceeded what expectations were heading into the season. Oh, yeah, for sure. And I think if last, if last season hadn't happened – I think a lot of fans might have taken this receiving group for granted because, you know, with Phil Longo's offense, you just assume you just assume production from those positions. But I think after last season with, you know, Josh Downs going most of the year being the only receiving threat, I think it, I think it's easier for people to appreciate how well these young receivers are playing through the first three games. Like a guy, a guy like Kobe Pesor has been the biggest surprise to me. He's a, the longer slot. He has really good hands. And I think uh, I think. Just him, that depth in that slot position is a real, real big advantage for UNC at the receiving core, even with Josh Downs hurt. I, I, I don't know. I'm not going to say there's no drop off. There's obviously a drop off between Josh Downs and Kobe Pesor, but I think Kobe Pesor has done a really good job of closing that gap and not not letting the offense miss Josh Downs too much. Well, I like the toughness that Kobe plays with. Yeah. He kind of has a little bit of a running back mentality at receiver. Yeah. He could take it. Now, he did fumble against Georgia State, and he'll learn a lot from that. But some of the times he's gotten open, he's really had to fight to get open. So for a young guy who played three snaps last year on offense, I think we've seen a lot of growth from him and from that group. A concern is that they're incredibly thin. They Four receivers ran routes on Saturday Yeah, at Georgia State, and Andre Green ran five. And a lot of people are thinking, well, why isn't Andre Green on the field? Because – because everybody's at practice, right? They all see that he's tearing it up at practice right now. Yeah. Andre Green is an incredible talent. And when we saw him <clears throat> in August, it looked like, boy, this guy's going to get on the field right away. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and, but that's just a guy running routes. That's just a guy getting open and drills and stuff like that. In order to get on the field and stay on the field, you have to run routes as one of several others. So there is a cohesion thing. There is a chemistry thing. There's a teamwork thing in running routes. And what do you do when the route breaks up? What do you do when the quarterback is suddenly forced to move? So the ball's going to come from a different spot than it was designed. What do you do in various other situations when you're out there? How about blocking? There are a lot of things that go into it for why it takes some kids time to get onto the field. And it's taking – Andre Green time to get on the field a lot. Now, he did get five snaps at Georgia State. I think he got around five at App State as well. So he's clearly not ready to mix with the others out there on the field. Tyshawn Chapman is not getting on the field at all. So what you had basically the last couple of games is it's Pesor, J.J. Jones, and Gavin Blackwell, and that's it. That's a concern because they're running a lot of routes. <clears throat> uh, they're running way too many routes. They need to get healthy there. There is a chance that Antoine Green is back for Notre Dame. We're not sure about Josh Downs. The things I'm hearing about Josh Downs have a pretty wide range. Now, I'm not going to get into specifics right now out of respect to him, but uh, they may not have either one of them for Notre Dame. And they may not have either one of them for Virginia Tech. So then you go to Miami. I mean, we don't really know what's going to happen there. <clears throat> I do think as much as I like the fact that they're spreading the ball around, and the tight ends are helping to compensate somewhat for the receivers, certainly Bryce and Nesbitt. The fact that that room is really, really thin should be a concern to Carolina fans. I agree. And I'm actually glad you brought up concerns because that was my next point. I was going to, I thought we were being a bit too positive for the offense. And I think for me <laughs> personally, a concern. They have been impressive. Is, yeah, they have been, they, they have been <clears throat> impressive. But I think the uh, thing, uh, uh, area for growth for this offense is the ability. I would like to actually, I would like to hear your opinion on this is the ability of, uh, for them to sustain drives. 
And I think against Georgia State, they had six consecutive drives that ended in either a turnover or a, point, uh, or a punt. And I think the ability to string together longer drives will come with more with a more consistent running game. And we we I don't think we've quite seen that yet this season. We saw uh, Saturday as a game went along, the Tar Heel offensive line was able to start forcing a will and open up some holes for DJ Jones. Marion Hampton, but I think as the running as a running game gets more consistent, I think this offense will be able to uh, sustain longer drives. You know, eight, nine, ten play drives, kind of help that defense out, keep them off the field a little bit. That's I think that's my biggest concern for the offense. What do you think about that? Well, Marion Hampton had his second hundred yard game Saturday. He was, he was sixteen attempts for one hundred and ten yards. One of them was a fifty eight yard touchdown, just exploded up the gut. The other 15 carries, he gained, what, 52 yards. So that kind of speaks to your point. Um, so it would be 60, 60, 68 yards. But, you know, I'm trying to do the math here. It, yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't the, 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 one of the numbers that you want on a consistent basis if you're going to use the, the run game to grind out some drives, okay? Yeah. So what, what you want to see, is you want to be able to see consistent running between the tackles. You want to be able to see the guards maul. You want to be able to see the tackles do it. And this club pulls a lot. They Sometimes they pull both linemen on one side. Yeah. And it looks a little bit like they're slow sometimes. They're not getting there, and they clog up the hole. You don't need gap control if the linemen are slow and pulling because the linemen clog up the gap themselves. And, and I think you see that sometimes. So they, they haven't been super quick hitting with their inside runs. They got, because they're not immediately winning the, the battle at the snap at the line of scrimmage. They need to be better with that. They need to be better with their pulling or maybe lay off the pulling some and just block down. You know, use a tight end as a, as a pseudo fullback. And, and, and I don't know why teams don't do that more. Personally, yeah, I go back to the old days where a fullback hits the hole first and clears things out. I always, I think that that kind of makes a lot more sense than pulling some 320 pound guy who comes from further away and has to navigate the line of scrimmage and make sure that the center is not getting knocked back. Cause if he is the guard or tackle has to go around him to get to the yeah. hole. Um, I'm just not a huge fan of mega pulling. You know, if you're going to do a toss sweep, yeah, you pull a tackle or a guard for a toss sweep. But I, I'm not a, some counters, yes, you do, but they do it a lot. So, uh, and they're not going to change that strategy. So, what does that mean? That means they have to be better at the snap. Court gainer has to be better. The guards have to be better. And they have to be able to be bang, bang so the tackle or guard can get there and they can get the hole quickly. That to me, I think, is something that it would be interesting to see how they evolve in the inside runs. You got to be able to run the ball inside the tackles. We did a Twitter space Monday night where someone asked about Notre Dame. Uh, how, how do you beat Notre Dame? And I said, you got to run the ball. You got, you cannot become predictable in third down. If you're third and eight, you're predictable. If you're third and four, you're not predictable. You can use everything in the book. And I think that that's what this team needs to become on third down situations is to not be predictable. They do have a lot of third and long situations so far. And, and and that makes it easier for a defense to uh, to plan for them, and they can get timing down on those kind of situations. And then when you're only rolling out three wide receivers, it's it's easier to kind of get your bearings on what the team is doing. So I think for this offense to become the offense you said at the outset that it is, which I'm not going to go there just yet. They need to go through the gauntlet of the ACC. Uh, they need to be a better running team because 2020 was the best offense I've seen in North Carolina. They had NFL receivers, they had NFL running backs, they had NFL quarterback. We think that they have some of that stuff now, but these guys, none of them are as advanced yet as the skill guys were on that team. In order to become those guys, we have to see the inside runs, the off tackle stuff, evolve and become big time. They have to get to the second level consistently. It's one thing to pop off a 58 yard run, but you got to get sixes and sevens and sixes and sevens and eights enough that you just put a defense on its heels and then you strike with the passing game. We haven't really seen that yet other than a couple of stretches. And we need yeah. to see more of that in order to apply that moniker to this team, I think. Oh yeah, for sure. This team has to become more consistent in the run game. Also in the in the in pass blocking, I think the 
App State and Georgia State, the they didn't allow a sack against Texas A&M, but you know the past two games they've been a little, little, a little shaky up front in the past blocking game. Now I will give Drake May credit for, and this is a weird thing to compliment a quarterback on, but I think Drake May is really good at taking sacks. I think when, whenever he's facing danger, he never, he never. Uh, retreats backwards. He always steps up into the pocket and he exits the pocket out the side. So whenever he is caught, instead of it being a seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 catastrophic uh, loss, it's only a two, three, four yard loss. And I think that's really, I think that's something that's very underrated. And I think that's something that can also help this offensive line out com- compared to last year. I don't think the, I don't think other people on the team did the offensive line any favors last season. And I think a guy like Drake May is really, really make, helping them out Make, I'm not going to say making them look better than they are, but I think a guy like Drake made his decision making is really helping this group out as a whole. Yeah, except the jailbreak on the fourth down. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Saturday, the fourth and two for their own 30. Now it's a jailbreak. And he, he, he took the snap and all of a sudden, here they come. Like and it wasn't there, right? Jailbreak. He pump faked it. And Yeah, he just got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember. He had no chance on that one. Uh, well, yeah. they've allowed six sacks, three in the last two games. Uh, PFF had some thing about uh, Corey Gaynor, I guess, and Austin Richards uh, not allowing not any hurries. Pressures. Yeah, yeah, pressures and stuff. But they have allowed six sacks. So that's three in the last two games. So three against FBS teams. You don't want to go three against every FBS team you play. That puts Again, it puts yourself in a bind, makes you predictable if, it's, if they're not the fourth down plays. And they set you up in third and longs. So I still think they need to get a little bit better with the pass protection as well. And, sure. and Drake will get better in those situations. I think you're right what you're saying. But also, when he throws, when he moves, he's still working on a lot of that. Phil Long is very open. And, and so is Drake talking about the footwork. That's a lot of it is footwork. But for the most part, I like how he handles that, given the fact he's played three games. I, I think that he's shown a lot of maturity in those situations, a lot of poise in those situations, and he's only going to show more of it. A concern, fumbles. They fumbled five times. Yeah. They've lost three. So they they turned it over three times in the second half at Georgia State, and the defense saved them. So they fumbled five times. They've lost three. Uh, the opponents have only fumbled twice and lost one. So that's an area where this team needs to kind of flip the script. And it's an offense defense thing because you can win the turnover battle. If you have much better chance to win the turnover battle, if you don't turn it over. Mm-hmm. And of course, the other side of that is forcing some turnover. So Take right now they're losing the turnover battle because they're, they have an interception and they've lost three fumbles. So, uh, and it's not just running backs, the pace or fumble is something that, it's not a concern yet, but if it happens again, then it is. You don't want wide receivers fumbling. They've got to know when to go down because they've already gained yardage, and yeah. they tend not to be as secure with the balls running backs. I know I said something where he reminds me a little bit of as a running back as a receiver, and part of that's because his his need to get a couple extra yards, which <laughs> yeah. I dig. I mean, I'm totally cool with that in a lot of ways, but you got to be able to protect the ball. I mean, ball security is number one. The first thing you do, ball secure. I talked to you about in this business, the first thing I learned how to do is transfer or, or quote people, right? In yeah. football and offense, first thing I learned how to do is ball security. Ball security is paramount. So they uh, have got to cut that down a little bit, and they're going to face more ferocious defenses that will pop and go for the ball moving forward than they have so far. Mm. All right, AJ, the only position group that we haven't talked about so far is the young running back group. Uh, I think, obviously, Amari and Hampton is leading the way statistically, but I think – George Pitt, close when it comes to snap total snap count. Um, what what do you what is your opinion on this young running back group and how they can develop over the rest of the season? Well, they're really talented and they just need time. I, I think we've seen some situational stuff so far where you know Marion has his game, George has his game. Yeah, I, I think that they complement one another really well with their skills. I, I do agree. I, I try to stay away from comparisons, but I'm going to do this anyway. There is an element of Javante Michael there, but I think they're different players. And I honestly think that they're both have more natural talent. Well, Marion has more natural talent than Javante and George has more natural talent than, than Michael. It doesn't mean they're going to be better players, but they both shown flashes. And I think, 
I think with Omar, and he's just like a ball. He's like a football player. The football player plays running back. Uh, George is a really smart kid who I think has more that he could probably offer the offense. I mean, I'm, su- I'm surprised we don't see him line up in slot. I think he's a guy that can line up and slot some and give you some reps there and get him the ball in open space and see what he can do because that dude can scoot. He's got moves. He can scoot. He's a, he's a nose for the end zone guy. You know, Michael was like that. When Michael Carter was young. One of the things that stood out about him is he got the ball. He went to the goal line. Yeah, he didn't zigzag around all over the place. He went to the goal line. And George has a lot of that in him as well. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm not as down on DJ Jones as other people are. DJ is their best pass blocker. DJ has had some nice plays. And I think that there, there's an element of leadership there with him they need in that room. C- Carolina needs DJ Jones to play well. Yeah, They need to have a guy in their 20s in that room who kind of knows the lay of the land and can smack a few fannies every once in a while. They need that. So they need DJ Jones to continue to play well or play better. He's been inconsistent. But they need him to be effective. <clears throat> and they need Caleb Hood to come back. Caleb is a short yardage guy. He showed some speed um, at App State, I guess it was, with that long run at App State, which was a – Big time play responding to an app touchdown when they were on their move coming yeah, back. Right um, I do not know what the status with him is right now, but this bye week they're they're spending the bye week to get a lot of guys healthy, and he of course is among them. So I, the running back room is really talented. It's talented. It's diverse. I think you have a lot of situational guys. We've seen that they're okay playing four. You know, before they played, when they when they, they like to play three, they played three the first year with Antonio Williams being the third guy, and then they played two because there really wasn't a third guy. Now they're playing four. They're using all their skills. They're getting them on the field. I like that. I think that's fine. I think the kids are cool with it. I think the kids understand what the deal is. Uh, so I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty high on the running back room. And I do think it's going to get better as Petaway and Hampton especially get hit more and get hit by power of five guys on a regular basis, then they'll learn, to, they'll be, they'll get better at getting through holes. They'll get better at reading their blockers. Who was it the other day that rode the offensive tackle into the second level? It, it actually may have been DJ Jones. Yeah, and and that's the kind of thing they need to watch, you know, learning how to read your tackles, learning or your blockers, learning how to run off them, when to break from behind them. little things like that, that, these kids are going to experience and develop over the course of the next couple of months. It's going to be fun watching them develop. There's so much youth, dude. Yeah. Most of the guys that are, that are at, asked to produce right now are still in their teens. So they're so young. Now the line's not, but the guys touching the ball, they're young guys. And they've been pretty damn good so far. For young guys, they've had some mistakes, but they haven't had a bunch of holy crap type mistakes. They're just simple football mistakes that happen. So I think the uh, I think the needle is pointed in the right direction for this group. And there are some other stats I want to run through real in a moment as well, just kind of about this group to sort of solidify uh, how you and I both see this group, how it's performed so far, and the direction we think it's going. Just real quick before you do that. Um... When I was down on the field, I have to say the most impressive job that was done, I mean, the most impressive run for me that was done by Omari and Hampton was at the, it was the very first drive of the game. I believe it was a third and two and number 59 from Georgia State, the uh, no tackle, who will be an NFL player. People don't give Georgia State uh, defensive line enough credit, but those guys yeah. were really good. They're good. He, he hit Omari and Hampton one yard. It was third and two. They hand the ball off to Marion Hampton. He is hit one yard behind um, behind the line of scrimmage by a nose tackle, and Marion Hampton carries him for two yards. Like there's no there's no barrier between the defender and Marion Hampton. Or Marion Hampton literally carried him from for two yards. It's just a nice thing to see down there, uh, field level vantage point. I was I was very impressed by that. But you can go through those stats now. Yeah, no, Marion's not afraid of contact. And as yeah. he gets better at dealing with contact, as he gets hit by power five guys, he'll become a better player. <clears throat> so. Uh, it's one thing to not be afraid of contact, but you then have to learn how to play through contact. It's one thing to various do. levels of contact. But I agree with you about number 59 and also about Georgia State's defense. <clears throat> that Look, 
how do we process the App State game, right? Yeah, Carolina no, ran no. up a big, 63 points in at App in the biggest game of school history. And App turns around and holds Texas A&M to one offensive touchdown. How do we process that? Yeah. Is it just a, are they all one-offs in college football? Because, you know, the, the nature of the sport forces us to compare. Okay, so we're going to compare. Well, that makes Carolina look pretty good. App State's now ranked. Why isn't Carolina ranked? I mean, App State gave up 63 points at home to an unranked team. Yeah, that's true. Right? Yeah. And Carolina beat that team. So it's very interesting how it's very interesting how what how performances resonate nationally. Yeah, yeah. Carolina yeah. got dogged for their for their win at App State. Yeah. <laughs> and App State is lauded for their win at Texas A&M. And it's like, wait a second, didn't Carolina just run up and down the field on those guys in their stadium? But it doesn't matter. I think what it tells us, it kind of speaks to what you said earlier, that it, that sequence of games for App State tells me more about North Carolina's offense than it tells me about Texas A&M's offense. Oh, North yeah. Carolina's offense, when it's clicking, is close to unstoppable. I believe that it will be that way, especially when Josh is back, especially when Antoine Green's back, when Caleb Hood is healthy. And even Elijah Green couldn't run the ball the other day. They only had three backs. They had four backs in uniform, and Elijah Green had a, had a club. His right hand, I guess, was a club. He did yeah. a couple things on special teams, but you pointed that out that he was down there. He couldn't really do much. So they had three running backs and two of them were true freshmen. So they've gotten through the first three games relying on guys that were nowhere near campus this time a year ago. And the, and some of them that were Blackwell played three snaps. Pesor played three snaps. JJ Jones played 62 snaps. Bryson Nesbitt played 89 snaps last year. I mean, that's your production. And, and even even J, uh, DJ Jones only played 262 snaps in his career before this year. So Drake played 41 snaps last year. So there's a lot of newness. And we've seen development. They had that rough stretch at Georgia State. But I think that's good. I think that was healthy. I think they needed to have some ugly stuff on film to learn. Because as Max said last week, maybe they were getting a little, getting a little too high and mighty. So they got yeah. brought down to earth a little bit, still scored 35 points and had nearly 500 yards in a poor performance. So a couple other stats real quickly. They're 56.4% on third down. They're four for six on fourth down. I wrote a piece earlier this week about fourth down. I asked Mac after the game about going for it on the fourth that they didn't get. And he, he got a little uh, choppy with me because he, well, why aren't you asking about the one we converted? And you know what? I agree with him. I should have asked about that as well. I, my whole thought, my, the, the premise of my question was what's the thought process into these fourth down decisions? Cause they have faced eight fourth and two or less this year. And they've gone for it six times twice. They didn't go for it. And they're four for six. And he says, we should make it on fourth and two, no matter what. So yeah. look to see them go for it on fourth and two or less moving forward red zone. They're 10 for 11, but the one they didn't get was at the end of the game against Florida A&M. They had the backups in there, and they chose to run out the clock. So Mac will tell you that they're 10 for 10 with touchdowns in the red zone. So an issue last year was scoring touchdowns in the red zone. Three games in, that's not an issue at all. They're 10 for 10 with touchdowns. They have five running, five passing, I believe, is the breakdown. And you – Let's go to Drake May for a minute. 72 and 97, 930 yards, 11 TDs, one interception. The interception was on its 100th college pass, if you include last season. So um, there's a lot, a lot of positives three games in, but they step it up now. If this offense is what you say it is, we will see them produce against Notre Dame. Now, remember, the 2020 offense didn't produce against Notre Dame. They had a couple of good drives, and that was it. Notre Dame beat them up at the line of scrimmage. So I know that Notre Dame, their quarterback's out. I know they're 0-2. They haven't been very good offensively in the first two games, but they're still Notre Dame at the line of scrimmage. And that's the test I want to see this team have. I want to know where this team is on both sides of the line of scrimmage because that's going to tell me what, they're, what, they're, what kind of ceiling they have for the rest of the way. And I don't think we know the answer to that question yet. We're not going to know 
much of anything until they play the Fighting Irish. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Because they're gonna Notre Dame's gonna force them to block. Notre Dame's gonna force them to, to they're gonna force Drake to check down. They're going to force Drake to move. They're going to stuff the runs. They're going to make their fits. They're going to do all those things. They're going to force Carolina to block. Mm -hmm. So how good are these guys? Are they a better line than last year? Like some people think I'm not, I'm not buying into that just yet. I got to see more. Yeah. I got to see more, Brandon. I got to see more. And with all due respect, I got to see more than a and Florida A&M. App State and Georgia State. I need to see Notre Dame. I need to see Virginia Tech. I need to see Miami. I need to see what they do against those teams really to know where this line is because I still think there's a big question mark over the offensive line. I agree. Any other thoughts about the offense? Yeah, I mean, I just think if this offense can – I think this offense – I know I've already spoken about how I think – how prolific I think they – I think – if, we're not, I know this is not a defensive podcast, but I think if the defense can just help out the offense a little bit, I think we've seen in the past with Lincoln Riley, Oklahoma teams, how a prolific offense can carry a below average defense to really deep into the really deep into the postseason. So I'm really interested to see if this offense can be the strength that can carry this team where it wants to go. Well, the defense picked him up last weekend. Yeah. The offense yeah. turned yeah. it over three agree. times and it was agree. failed fourth down. And the defense allowed a total of three points in those four situations. And then they shut Georgia State out in the fourth quarter. We will talk about the defense we'll talk about that next. next. That's a heck of a segue right there. <laughs> he is Brandon P. I'm Andrew Jones. Don't forget, go to tarheelillustrated.com. It's just $8.33 a month. And you can be a Tar Heel insider too. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks.